Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. A very warm welcome to St Patrick's Church in Dunkmore for this midweek reflection and worship. We continue our journey through the Psalms tonight, following on from last week when we looked at Psalm 90. This week we turn to its partner, Psalm 91. But first, let us worship God as we sing together. shall say to the Lord, my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I put my trust. For he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He shall cover you with his wings and you shall be safe under his feathers. His faithfulness shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of any terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of the sickness that destroys at noonday. Though a thousand fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, yet it shall not come near you. Your eyes have only to behold, to see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, and the most high your stronghold, there shall no evil happen to you, neither shall any plague come near your tent. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because they have set their love upon me, therefore will I deliver them. I will lift them up, because they know my name. They will call upon me, and I will answer them. I am with them in trouble, I will deliver them and bring them to honour. With long life will I satisfy them, and show them my salvation. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Last week we thought about 
house stands 90 to 106 were possibly part of an Exodus collection. But we're looking at the second of those tonight, but I'm not going to take you through all 17 over the next few weeks. Of all of the Psalms, this is one which is one of the most encouraging and thought provoking. You know, last week we were thinking of the, the shortness and the frailty of life, but the ultimate certainty of eternity. Well, it's that certainty which is the thrust of this Psalm. One thing I haven't really talked about much over the, these past number of weeks is the idea of Hebrew parallelism. <coughs> really, it's a way of saying the same thing twice, in different words, or saying the opposite thing to illustrate. And that's why the Psalms are always broken down into half verses. And when we read them in worship, rather than sing them, we read them by alternate half verses. It's a lovely example here in, in, in verse 1. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. An even better example is the later verse where you will tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and dragon you will trample underfoot. But coming back to that first verse, dwell and abide. Do they simply mean the same thing? Are they synonyms? To say that whoever lives in God's shelter will live in God's shelter doesn't make sense, does it? So perhaps it should be read as, this is what you need to do, to dwell under the defence of the Most High. <clears throat> and when you do that, you will discover that God is taking care of you. In other words, take refuge in Him and you will find it a safe lodging. And that opening verse is like a text, a model, a summary of the rest of the psalm, which falls into two basic parts. In the first, the psalmist claims that the Lord is his refuge. And then he turns to his fellow believers and encourages them to do likewise and take those implications to heart. Each half then sets forth a series of vivid pictures of the perils that can beset God's people, but also the protection which God provides for them. The first part, verse 3 to 8, lists seven such perils. The terrors of night, the arrows of the day, the pestilence that walketh in darkness, the sickness that destroys in the noonday, and they are flanked by the snares and slanders of verse 3, and the fall of many in verse 7. But along with that fearful list is an assurance that we don't need to fear for these things. There are two splendid pictures of the Lord's care. In verse 4, the warm protectiveness of the parent bird and the hard, unyielding strength of armour. Verses 9 through to 16, it, it's, it's the way in which God promises his care that provides that framework. Two further perils are mentioned, the stumbling foot, the ravenous beast. Now, at the beginning and at the end of the psalm, the care is exercised by God himself. But here in the middle, it's delegated to his angels, the spirits who serve him by serving his children. According to verse 11, we have not just one guardian angel of peace, but many angels to guard us. Now, if we were to take them in their literal sense, any of those troubles could beset each one of us. They're representative of all the things that people fear. But taken metaphorically, they stand for an ever wider range of ills that are, in, in effect, a really comprehensive list intended to tell us that there's nothing for God's people to fear. There are no exclusions in this insurance policy, nothing hidden in the small print. <clears throat> and it's that very comprehensiveness which makes this psalm so, so appealing, so attractive, and so suitable for any time. The names of God in verse 1, the Most High, the Almighty, take us right back to Genesis, to Abraham. And you know, it, it's most likely that this was written to try and encourage the children of Israel at some, some time of intense national trauma. Some suggest the Babylonian exile, some put up further back at the Exodus in Egypt. And you know, there, there, 
in the psalm, there are so many echoes of the Exodus story, phrases from Deuteronomy, the wings of God, finding refuge, the guardian angel, protection from illness, the promise of long life. It's interesting that this psalm is quoted twice in the New Testament. Both Matthew and Luke's account of the temptation of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness. Jesus had responded to Satan's first temptation, as he would to the other two by quoting Deuteronomy. Thus, he showed himself to be the true Israel, the true Adam, the one who fulfilled the law, who completed and obeyed the law. You know, as, as Shakespeare's merchant said, the devil will quote scripture for his own purpose. And in the temptation of Jesus, that's just what he does. Standing at the highest point of the temple, he tells Jesus to throw himself down, for as it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. It seems like logical reason, doesn't it? Yet the fallacy is that it's an artificially created crisis. The context of the psalm is of our trusting God in the situations which result from obedient service. The Satan, the deceiver, the devil is manipulating scripture, using those words where they don't apply. The promise of God isn't an excuse for reckless living. Rather, it's for those who love and acknowledge God and call upon him, who in a spirit of devotion and submission want to go his way and not their own way. Only the foolish and the wicked put God to the test. My final reflection tonight brings us to some of the most difficult words in the psalm. No harm shall befall you. Because we know that harm befalls God's people. Bad things happen to good people. People who sincerely love and trust in the Lord Jesus. So what are we to make of these words? Let me take you to somewhere completely different, to St. Paul, writing to the Romans, who will separate us from the love of Christ? And he quotes, to bring us back on track, from Psalm 42, 44, verse 22. Paul doesn't say that no harm will befall you. Paul says nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. The crucial thing that he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, Whatever is thrown at us, we are still more than conquerors through him who loved us. In all these things, we are saved in them, not from them. The things that the world sees as negatives are transformed into positives by a divine alchemy which turns lead to gold. Because Spurgeon is a writer I don't really quote from, but perhaps here he has something profound to say. Ill to him is no ill, but only good in a mysterious form. Loss is enriching, sickness is his medicine, reproach is his honour, death is his gain. So if we return again to St. Paul, no evil can befall us, for everything is overruled for good. Like Job, we may well struggle with events around us, but if we continue to trust and to remain steadfast, God's good purposes will one day be revealed, and we can be certain that no real harm can befall us, so long as we dwell under the shelter of the Most High. And there's the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the ascribed as is most justly due, almighty, majesty, dominion, power, and glory, henceforth and forevermore.
and to God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you all.